Good afternoon. I join my colleague, uh, uh, Father Massa, in acknowledging your very gracious invitation to be a part of this conference, and I'm singularly delighted to be here with you, especially since my first experience with Mormons was not so positive. Um, I'm going to take you back in time now. This was about the time that the Los Angeles Temple was dedicated. My mother and father and a great aunt decided my brother and I should see this. So we went, we know when you had the public open houses, and hundreds of people there. I remember this was a cold night in November. And uh, we were in line to go in, and suddenly we were told that, I don't remember whether it was my brother was too young, or both my brother and I were too young to go in, so that we were going to be separated from our parents. We were taken to a, a tent where we were given something warm to drink and crayons to occupy ourselves while my parents and my aunt went through the uh, temple. Don't worry, I've long forgiven that incident. Um, and to prove it, uh, last summer, when I was privileged to be a part of a, a small Catholic group who visited at the invitation of the uh, Public Affairs Office of the Mormon Church here in Los Angeles, we visited Utah and, wanted, and had some wonderful discussions with uh, Mormon theologians and visited many wonderful sites there, one of which was a temple uh, whose name I can never pronounce, I'm not even going to attempt to. Oh, that's why I can't pronounce it. <laughs> And while we were there, they were, you, you know, there's stairs, right? All kinds of stairs. And we were on one of these stairwells. And uh, we were coming down, and there was another group going up. And a man saw me. Uh, we tend to stick out dressed like this, you know. And he stopped the line behind him and started engaging me in conversation. He wanted to know who I was and why I was there, where I was from, and all this other stuff. And I thought, well, this is going to be very interesting, because the line was building behind him, you know, and the line was building behind me coming down the stairs. So um, long story short, uh, I uh, said, well, if you're ever in Los Angeles, um, by all means, call me, and I'd be happy to give you a tour of our cathedral, since you're taking a tour here, and we're taking a tour of your temple. Never, of course, thinking he'd contact me. Uh, in less than a month, he was in Los Angeles, he and his family. He did call me. I do give tours at our cathedral here. Some of you know that. I give tours. And we met, and we had a delightful afternoon together. And I allowed his two young kids to enter into the <laughs> <laughs> A bit of a disclaimer before I begin. Um, I am Catholic, but not Roman Catholic, as my two colleagues are here. I am what we term Greek Catholic or Eastern Catholic. Catholic, but not Roman. My seminary training was not at a Roman Catholic seminary, but rather at the Greek Orthodox Seminary in Boston, Massachusetts. There we were immersed in Greek and Eastern the theological approaches, the theology itself, the dogmatics, ethics, and spirituality, and mentality. Having said that, then, I'd like to share with you a little bit about Eastern Christianity's approach to interfaith dialogue and ecumenical relations. While I was a student at Holy Cross Seminary in 1984, a gentleman by the name of Photios Liatis wrote a book entitled A Companion to the Greek Orthodox Church. In that book, there is a chapter on the Orthodox Church's relations with other churches. But in the glossary at the end of the book, ecumenism is defined in one simple sentence. And that sentence reads, the ecumenism is the movement of Christian churches towards a mutual understanding of their problems and the concept of unity and love willed by Christ. In 1998, Father Thomas Hopko, who was then the dean of St. Vladimir Theological Seminary, which is more of a Russian uh, seminary, uh, in an article published in the St. Vladimir Seminary News entitled The Church, the Seminary, and the Ecumenical Movement, wrote this, this of ecumenism. The purpose of the ecumenical movement is basically twofold. The first goal is to identify doctrinal and liturgical differences among those who claim Christ as the Lord, to clarify disagreements, and to overcome, if possible, errors and divisions. The second purpose is to cooperate in doing good works where such cooperation for the good of human beings, such as feeding the hungry, aiding the poor, 
settling refugees is possible and desirable. In fact, the suffering Orthodox of this century have been greatly aided in many ways by ecumenical ph philanthropy. How do Eastern Christians regard and assess other religions, viewing them through the lenses of our distinctive theological approaches, and at the same time remain faithful to Eastern Christian principles? I'm going to limit our focus this morning only to our relations with our fellow Christians, since for most Orthodox, their involvement with other religions is ecumenical with fellow Christians, and with a notable exception of Judaism and Islam, not interreligious. And I propose to do this by walking you through a, the final report of the Special Commission on Orthodox Participation in the World Council of Churches. Because in that report, I think you will discern some resonance and some dissonance with your own situation, as I've uh, uh, as I perceive it developing from being here this last yesterday and today. The involvement of the Orthodox churches in the World Council of Churches and other ecumenical bodies has been and continues to be a matter of no little debate among Orthodox Christians. The discussion often takes, a, takes on a rather harsh and polemical quality. Sometimes it's unclear to the Orthodox what ecumenism even is. You might be having that same discussion amongst yourselves. Three basic perceptions emerge in these discussions. First, is it a heresy? Is it heretical for us to participate in these things? Well, ecumenism is not a heresy, or at least ecumenism that is derided as heresy in some orthodox opinion, and that ecumenism which is actually practiced by some orthodox are, in fact, two separate things whatsoever. If one looks at the anathemas, you know what that means? That's a condemnation, a Greek word meaning a condemnation, um, by which a person can be expelled from the church. If one looks at these anathemas, which have been written about ecumenism, it's clear that what is being anathematized is the so-called branch theory, something which Orthodox do not hold whatsoever. We'll come back to that in a few moments. Secondly, Orthodox involvement in ecumenism is viewed, and this might resonate with you, as a missionary activity. Father Stanley Harricus, one of my professors at Holy Cross, in his book, The Living Truth, The Praxis of Orthodox Christian Ethics, writes, and I quote now, Orthodox involvement in the ecumenical movement consists primarily of dialogue, discussion, and the sharing of views and positions. The main purpose which the Orthodox have in entering into the dialogues is to communicate the truth of the Orthodox Christian faith to those who are unaware of it. At the same time, there is no question that Orthodox Christians and hierarchs have learned much in their contacts with Christians of other churches. That's not to say that they're there to convert people. That's up to the person's individual response to God. But they're there to make their position and their faith known. And thirdly, certainly the Orthodox today are uh, examining their whole involvement in the whole world of ecumenicity. The Orthodox presence at the World Council of Churches has often been problematic, both for the World Council and for the Orthodox themselves. On the one hand, the non-homogeneity of the churches and denominations participating in the Council, the diverging theological and ecclesiastical positions of the interlocutors, <coughs> the problematics of the ecumenical movement itself, and the methodology by which the World Council operates is placed up against the very specificity of orthodox ecclesiology and theology. There's also, we have to admit, some historical misgivings vis-a-vis -vis certain Western ideas. And these facts make relationships sometimes difficult. Certainly complicated. I'm sure you would agree with that. They're complicated. First, a little bit of history. Uh, we've, we've talked about at this conference some foundational documents for being involved in this type of work. For the Orthodox, the foundational document is the a 1920 
imagine that. January 1920, uh, patriarchal encyclical from the Patriarchate of Constantinople entitled, Unto the Churches of Christ Everywhere. Permit me to share with you three paragraphs of that document. <coughs> Paragraph one. Our own church holds that rapprochement between the various Christian churches and fellowship among them is not excluded by doctrinal differences that exist among them. In our opinion, such rapprochement is highly desirable and necessary. It would be useful in many ways for the real interest of each particular church of the whole Christian body and also for the preparation and advancement of that blessed union which will be completed in the future accordance with the will of God. We therefore consider that the present time, remember 1920, that the present time is the most favorable for bringing toward this important question and studying it together. Paragraph four. We believe that the following two measures would greatly contribute to the rapprochement which is so much desired and which would be so useful. And we believe that they would be both successful and fruitful. First, we consider as necessary and indispensable the removal and abolition of all mutual mistrust and bitterness among the different churches which arise from the tendency of some of them to entice and proselytize adherents of other confessions. For nobody ignores what is unfortunately happening today in many places, disturbing the internal peace of the churches, especially in the East. So many troubles and sufferings are caused by other Christians and a great hatred and enmity are aroused when such with such insignificant results by this tendency of some to proselytize the followers of other Christian confessions. After this establishment, pardon me, after this essential reestablishment of sincerity and confidence among the churches, we consider secondly that above all, love should be rekindled and strengthened among the churches so that they should have, they should no more consider one another as strangers and foreigners, but as relatives didn't we hear that term yesterday? But as relatives, as kin, in other words, and as being part of the household of Christ, fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise of God in Christ, to quote Ephesians 3.6. The document continues, for if the different churches are inspired by love and place it before anything else in their judgments of others and their relations with them, instead of increasing and widening the existing dissensions, they should be enabled to reduce and diminish them. The document goes on then to list some 11 ways in which this love might in fact be um, put into effect, to, uh, in effect. I won't go through all of those. Let's look now specifically at the report uh, the sp of the Special Commission about Orthodox participation in the World Council of Churches. There was a 60-member special commission created by the World Council at their 8th assembly in uh, Zimbabwe in 1998. Behind the assembly's decision to create this commission were increasingly vocal expressions of concern about the World Council among the Orthodox churches. These began at a meeting in Thessalonica in Greece in May 1998. Central Orthodox concerns included some of the activities of the World Council itself, certain, and I quote now, developments within some of the Protestant members of the Council that are reflected in the debates of the World Council, end quote, lack of progress in ecumenical theological discussions, and the perception that the present structure of the World Council makes meaningful Orthodox participation increasingly difficult and for many even impossible. The commission then uh, experiencing a genuine spirit of fellowship had the courage on occasion to speak the truth in love as strongly held convictions were vigorously defended. In its work, the commission identified five areas for specific study which were intensively investigated in subcommittees and in plenary sessions. I'd like to walk you through the, briefly those five. First, ecclesiology. What does it mean to be church? What is meant by the visible unity of the church? The response to those questions is influenced 
by the existence of two basic ecclesiological self-understandings within the World Council. Namely, those churches, such as the Orthodox, which identify themselves with the one holy Catholic and Apostolic Church, and those who see themselves as parts of that one holy Catholic and Apostolic Church. These two ecclesiastical positions affect whether or not churches recognize each other's baptism, as well as their ability or inability to recognize one another as churches. They also affect the way they understand the whole functioning of the World Council. Father Thomas Hopko, in the, uh, the, uh, the document I cited earlier, answers in this way for the Orthodox about this question. He writes, and the emphasis here will be mine, but you'll get the point. Never has an Orthodox Christian, and certainly not anyone from St. Vladimir Seminary, participated in the sacraments of a non-Orthodox service, nor given sacraments to non-Orthodox people, nor has, Orthodox, nor has an Orthodox Christian ever denied that the Orthodox Church is the one holy Catholic and Apostolic Church of Christ, or failed to state clearly that the Orthodox consider other Christian churches to be in some way defective, incomplete, and in error. Ecumenical activity in no way means that participants must recognize each other as real churches, or say that all churches are the same, or embrace some sort of branch theory in which the Orthodox are considered to be but one branch of the full true church. If this were so, then ecumenism would indeed be a heresy. But it is not so. Those who say that it is are either ignorant or mendacious. Quite a statement by Father Hopko. Second, the whole area of social and ethical issues, which has certainly been alluded to this morning. The special commission was created in part because of dissatisfaction raised by Orthodox churches and others with the ways in which certain social and ethical issues reached the agenda of the World Council. And once they reached the agenda, the way in which they were handled. Specifically, there had been the perception that the churches were being coerced into treating issues they deemed either foreign to their life or inappropriate for a world forum. There's also that the, the perception amongst the Orthodox that sometimes the World Council was an occasion to preach to the churches rather than to be the instrument for their theological dialogue. This holds particularly within the bioethical and biotechnical sphere. For example, churches certainly are challenged to articulate a Christian ethical approach to issues such as cloning and in vitro fertilization, abortion, generic research, and the definition of marriage. The way in which a church or churches together orders and structures its own decision making on these moral matters is in itself a prime ethical issue. Who decides what and by what means? The forms of decision making and communication already embody a social ethic and influence moral teaching and practice. Ways of exercising power, governance, and access have moral dimensions as well. To ignore all of this in the orthodox mindset is to fail to understand why moral issues can be so divisive. So what procedures exist for dealing with social and ethical issues proposed for common deliberation? For example, how should it be determined that a given matter is directed to the World Council for discussion by a genuine church or by some pressure group advocating one position or the other. It was the expectation also of the Special Commission that the use of consensus decision-making with an increase in mutual trust would make it easier for all to participate fully in discussing any burning ethical and social issues. It's precisely the employment of the consensus decision-making model that enables the Orthodox Church to fully participate and to do so happily in the new Christian Churches Together movement. Thirdly, an issue which we haven't really touched on at the conference, at least perhaps not as fully as this, common prayer. Would common prayer be divisive for you? 
It is for the Orthodox. Why? The Special Commission notes, and I quote now, the contemporary Christian commitment to visible unity by its range, its depth, and its instruments is a new reality in church history. Equally, the possibility of praying together in ecumenical settings is also a new challenge with specific and particular mission to accompany and strengthen Christians in their journey towards unity. In order to make progress in dialogue with one another, Christians need to plead to, together for the divine assistance. And then the commission goes on to note what very significantly. However, for some, prayer with Christians outside one's own tradition is not only uncomfortable, but considered to be impossible. There are orthodox canons which prohibit certain forms of shared prayer. We can go through the questions and answers if you're interested in that, but it's true. Stanley, uh, Father Stanley Herakas, again in that book that I quoted earlier, uh, makes this quite clear. He writes, and I quote, the Orthodox Church experiences, experiences a particular problem in ecumenical relations with heterodox churches. Since the church without question identifies itself as the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, it raises a serious question of relationship of the one holy Catholic and apostolic church with churches and with groups calling themselves churches. The ancient church solved this problem by waging a war of attack upon all non-Orthodox churches and prohibiting any kind of contact with them. Significantly, the Orthodox church has felt that there is a need to maintain this separation in terms of official church communion. Thus, the Orthodox church and members of the Orthodox church may not participate on an ecclesial or sacramental level in the worship of other churches nor is it permitted for Orthodox priests to concelebrate with other non-Orthodox clergy, nor is it believed that Orthodox laity may participate in the sacraments of other Christian churches. This particular problem to which Father Harakas is uh, uh, referring here is both ecclesiological, ecclesiological and theological. There is that, that dictum, huh? the ancient Latin, and I might, might butcher this, so... Um, uh, Lex orande est lex credende. What you pray is what you believe. Okay? In ecumenical settings, sometimes what is prayed is certainly very contrary to what many Orthodox would hold, what they would believe. And so th th there's a distinction then made between um, confessional prayer and interconfessional prayer. Before we go there, there's also the, the whole question of language and symbols in corporate worship. Sometimes very problematic from an orthodox point of view. Scripture and tradition offer a variety of metaphors and images for God. These metaphors and images are used in common prayer to describe God and God's activities in, the, in history. However, orthodox would make a distinction between an image of God and the name of God. People call upon God with many, uh, many different names. The Orthodox, however, insist that the revealed and biblical names for God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, not Creator, Redeemer, Sustainer, anything like that, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit should be used when naming God in common prayer. There's also the question of the leadership of women in common prayer. This might be best addressed then by looking at the distinction between confessional prayer and interconfessional prayer. And the Special Commission makes that this distinction. Confessional prayer expresses the integrity of a given tradition. Its ecclesial identity is clear. It is offered as a gift to the, the gathered community by a particular delegation of the participants, even as it invites all to enter into the spirit of prayer without actually participating, per se, in the service. It is conducted and presided over in accordance with its own understanding and practice. Interconfessional prayer, on the other hand, is an opportunity to celebrate together, drawing from the resources of a variety of traditions. Such prayer is rooted in the past experience of ecumenical activity, as well as the gifts 
which the various member participants bring to the table. But it does not claim to be the worship of any given or particular church, nor any kind of hybrid church or super church. It is, the document says, it is not nor ought not be celebrated or presided over in such a way that it would associate it with any one church or imply that it has an ecclesial state. Thus, in a, in a confessional common prayer, an Orthodox woman, for example, would not preside. <coughs> Divine liturgy, for example. If the Orthodox were here, they were going to serve the liturgy at, as a way of sharing their way of worship with you. You would not find a woman presiding, believe me. However, in an interconfessional prayer, if we were to have a prayer service, Mormons, Catholics, Orthodox together, the Orthodox, I'm going out on a limb here, probably would preside, would, would attend, would participate. But they, the idea of a woman being, have a presiding role in that would be problematic for them. I ran into this here, not too terribly long ago, uh, during the week of prayer for Christian unity of all things, Father. We're having a service with, during this week of prayer of Christian unity. We normally go in rotation. The presider goes in rotation with Larco, Lutherans, Anglicans, Roman Catholics, Orthodox, that <coughs> rotation. Um, the service was all planned, all set up, and it was to be the uh, Lutheran pastor, the Lutheran ecumenical officer was to preside. The Lutheran ecumenical officer became ill the night before and called me and said, I can't be there. You better get so-and-so from the uh, Anglican or Episcopal church. Well, their ecumenical officer at that time was a woman. So I merely called and said, you're on. Tomorrow morning, you're, pres you're presiding at this. The Orthodox participants, when they arrived and found that a woman was participating, even in this interconfessional service, took me aside and said, you should not have pulled this on us, Father. You know, you should have warned us. Well, what do you do in these situations? You know? So these type of things are very problematic. Fourthly, consensus model of decision making. Why is this important? For the Orthodox perspective, because of their, 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 they're numerically outnumbered on most of these ecumenical bodies and commissions, they don't feel they're being heard. They can't make their position known. If it's a one church, one vote type of thing, they're always outvoted. Therefore, they prefer the more consensus making model which they maintain enhances the participation of all members, and preserves the rights of churches or regions or groupings, especially which hold such minority opinions. Consensus allows any group of churches or individual church through a spokesperson then to have their objections to any proposal addressed and satisfied prior to the adoption of the proposal. It also implies that a church or a group of churches can stop any proposal from passing until they are uh, fully addressed. The Mormons here in Los Angeles, along with the Catholics, faced this most recently at our Interreligious Council, where there was a move to move away from this consensus mode of making decisions and go to uh, one group, one vote type of thing. But fortunately, the Holy Spirit inspired someone to find uh, a, a line in one of the bylaws which prevent us from making that move. So we will both be able to continue to participate there. Fifthly, fifthly and lastly, membership. Again, what constitutes a church? That was one of the original questions I asked for the World Council and for the Orthodox. Such a, a church does the following things. It uh, confesses the Lord Jesus Christ as God and Savior, according to the scriptures, and therefore seeks to fulfill together these churches, their common calling to the glory of the one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Its life and witness as a church must profess this faith in the triune God as expressed in the scriptures and in the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed. The church maintains a ministry proclaiming the gospel and celebrating the sacraments. I told you about the language, uses the terms Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Recognizes in other church members elements of the true church, even if it does not regard them as churches in the true sense of the word. Having said all this, then, I'd like to conclude with two brief quotes about to show you the difference in approach to all of this in the Orthodox world. What form of ecumenical activity is permissible? What is not? First quote. This is from the website 
of the Russian Orthodox Church outside Russia, dated 23 April 2006, authored by Archbishop Ilarion. What is, uh, it starts, intercommunion is unacceptable. The performance of ecumenical services together with churches with which we do not have a Eucharistic communion is unacceptable. The branch theory is unacceptable. Unacceptable are any compromises in theological, ecclesiological, or moral matters. Unacceptable is theological syncretism when the foundations of the Christian doctrine are diluted, when the fundamental postulates of the Orthodox Church are questioned. Allowable and necessary are those forms of inter-Christian dialogue which give the Orthodox Church the possibility of freely witnessing to the truth in the face of the non-Orthodox world. One shouldn't forget, he writes, that witness cannot be a monologue since it assumes the existence of listeners and therefore of communication. Dialogue implies two sides, a mutual openness to communication, a willingness to understand not only an open mouth, but also a heart enlarged. I like the last part of that. And finally, from Archbishop Athanasios, Archbishop of Tirana and all, all of Albania. He wrote a wonderful book published in 2003 entitled Facing the World. In that book there is a chapter on Orthodox relations with other churches. Listen to this. The criterion by which Christians evaluate and accept different religions and religious ideas and principles is Jesus Christ, the Word of God, the incarnation of Trinitarian God's love. The love that is his message carries together with the breadth and profundity revealed in the Gospels constitutes the indispensable core of our religious experience as well as its fulfillment. We come to know and experience his love through the creative activity of the Holy Spirit. Christ's work for salvation of the entire world is continued through time by the church which is his body. While the Christian attitude is severely critical of other religions as organic and unified systems, Christians should show a great deal of understanding, respect, and love for people who live in environments where different religions and, idea and ideologies dominate. This is because every human person's divine origin is never lost, even if his or her religious conceptions are mistaken. Every human being was created in God's image and is therefore our sister and our brother. I hope that Catholics and Mormons can acknowledge that we are sisters and brothers and continue to work together. Thank you for having me.